Huh. Okay. Oops. Here we go. Custom. Custom live streaming. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're good. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Golden Thread Productions. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those who don't know, Golden Thread is the first American theater company focused on the Middle East. We are here based in San Francisco. <clears throat> and today we're talking with three artists from our youth program, um, Golden Thread Fairy Tale Players. Uh, who have been involved with a production of uh, a Palestinian play, Leila's Quest for Flight. So I'm really happy to welcome uh, our artists, Maya Nazal, Sarah Al Kassab, and Simone Block. Welcome, guys, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Taranj. Thank you for having us. Um, so let's start with just having you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, both your cultural background and how you got started with theater. So let's go, uh, let's start with Sarah. Ahlan wa sahlan, I'm Sarah al Kassab. I've been with the Fairy Tale Players since around 2007 uh, when we were a seven person ensemble. Um, I'm, my background in theater is in, as, in production as a costume artist, a uh, costumer and designer. Um, started off in fairy tale players as a performer and also a costumer. And now I'm the stage manager for Layla's Quest for Flight and have been in several fairy tale player productions. My background is first generation Arab American from Jordan and Majid they made my thobe here. Wait, hold on, wait for it, wait for it. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and you, you've been with Golden Thread Fairy Tale Players since 2003, right? So it's seven. No, yeah. I, I came to San Francisco in 2006. So I think uh -huh. it was six or seven when we started with uh, the girl who lost her smile and we yes. were still a seven yes. woman ensemble. Yeah, that was uh, Karim Al Rawi's story. Uh, great. So let's move on to uh, Simone. Simone, you're muted. Right. My name is Simone Block, and um, I came to the Bay Area like 20 years ago, 19 and a half now. And I was already a performer, but I've been carrying two hats. I'm a performer and I'm a teacher. So I've been a performer for a long, um, for quite a long time. And um, I have a background in dance and I've done a lot of physical theater. And in Leila, I, uh, Leila Quest for Flight, I am playing mainly Leila the six-year-old Palestinian little girl. So I have no ethnical, ethnic um, Middle Eastern background, but I did a uh, two tour in Algeria, in North Africa when I was in my 20s, fell in love with the country and more. And then it happened that I do have a grandson who speaks Farsi. So life goes around and I'm completely <laughs> involved with this culture one more time. And I enjoyed it very much. So yeah, theater, Middle Eastern, dancing, teaching, being around little kids. That's pretty much a big part of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Go, Maya. Hi, I'm Maya Nazan. Um, I am Palestinian American. I was raised in San Jose, California. So I'm, um, you know, I'm, I didn't immigrate or anything. I'm first generation. Uh, but I was culturally raised Syrian. That's where most of my family is and where I used to visit. Um, I also grew up in Jordan for a little bit. So I have a lot of different, um, exposure to different cultures in the Middle East because they're all very different. Uh, I didn't start doing Middle Eastern theater until Leila's Quest for Flight. I, I started doing theater for 
Um, well, I started in high school, but it was all just American plays, old white, <laughs> written by old white men. Uh, so it was very exciting to do something that was a lot closer to my identity. And I've had so much fun and I've got to uh, play around with a completely different medium with movement and um, and have the audience be children, which is, I mean, you have to expand your imagination to a completely different degree because um, you don't learn that in school. I didn't learn <laughs> how to perform for kids in school, but it is very different and I've had so much fun. Um, yeah, I want to maybe start by just talking about Layla's quest for flight and, and just to give some background to, to uh, folks who are watching. Uh, fairy tale players, in terms of the aesthetic of the performance, uh, we utilize uh, traditional physical theater aesthetics, um, many of them from the Middle East, like uh, uh, epic storytelling or uh, physical comedy. We also utilize commedia dell'arte, we utilize folk dance. Um, and then we work with actors who are multilingual, who can actually bring in uh, their own language into the play. Uh, the play is about 30 minutes long and it's performed by two actors who often have to perform many, many different parts. Uh, back when Sarah started, we had a seven member ensemble and each actor perhaps performed one or two parts, but now these two actors. Maya, how many parts do you play in uh, Layla's Quest? I think I play over 10. <laughs> over 10. Yes. Like maybe yeah. 12, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so Layla's Quest is the story of a little Palestinian girl who wants to become a pilot. And um, uh, it's not until she has to prepare for going to school when she goes to the optometrist and, and is told that she doesn't have 20-20 vision. And because of that, she can't become a pilot. So she has a meltdown and uh, these mythic birds come to help her uh, realize her dream and realize that she can achieve whatever she wants to achieve. So... Um, Sarah, how, how, how has it been for you being involved with Layla's Quest since you have sort of a longer history with um, fairy tale players? Well, for being part of Layla's Quest, it's been amazing to be stage manager and support all these characters in the story. Um, my background in the Bay Area has been as a children's performer for a life performances, mostly like private, corporate, and birthday party events. So I have a lot of interactive experience. And like when I, I can talk to the actors and be like, when the kids do, blah, 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 then you can blah, 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 because that's a, a continuous thing. Um, for me, it's been wonderful to be part of Layla's Quest for Flight because it's always wonderful to see somebody who looks like you or sounds like you in a show as a, as a child. Um, just represent, like we said, representation matters, but specifically uh, we don't have a story focused on someone from the Middle East. We, like we're usually a side character or an anti-character. So it was really nice to center, you know, our little girls. Others, Maya, Simone? Wow, it's been such a pleasure to be to be a uh, Leila Quest for Flight. So um, I had three mothers. <laughs> Maya is my last mother. <laughs> 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 They're all pretty, pretty um, much younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am a grandma. <laughs> so that's been interesting. So, so what Simone is talking about is that we had to recast the role that Maya is playing. We had to recast it three times. So during the two year tour, Simone has been partnered with three different actors 
and all three were much younger than you. Yes. Uh, and I remember when you came to audition, you assumed you were auditioning for the role of the mother. And then when we <laughs> cast you for Layla, you were surprised. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I I am not six year old <laughs> no girl, but uh, but it's been such a pleasure. It's been a treat for me. And I must say that I had a couple times where I had to play an old man in the evening in a in the show, completely different, twice, two different uh, theater productions, and in the morning I was the piggy tail little Layla jumping all over the place and rolling and doing all those things. As an actor, it's such a pleasure to be able to switch from one character to another. And to be there, I mean, it's not it's not completely superficial at all. I mean, I have to go into the into the character and it's been it's been a treat, really. I I enjoyed very much. And it's very physically demanding for you, isn't it? Because you have to tumble and do cartwheels. Um, what else yeah. do you do physically? And roll around on the ground <laughs> like the rolling patundera. <laughs> And I jumping. remember always sweeping for Tunjara. Yeah. yeah because otherwise, <laughs> let me get hurt. Yeah, um, it's uh, 30 minutes of action-packed performance, really. And I just want to interrupt as a stage manager, not only are Maya uh, mother and Simone uh, Leila, among many other characters, but they also play within the construct of our fairy tale players show. We always have players as though we're a traveling band of players and we're gonna put on this and many other shows for you. So Maya is also player one in all of those responsibilities and Simone is player two in all of those responsibilities and the characters that come along with it. And That's I play right. an old man in the show. It's <laughs> you you play an old sheikh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And Enjoy. How about you, Maya? Jump in. Um, so I joined, it was definitely different for me because I joined after there had already been two um, people cast as mother and player one. So it was difficult trying to navigate it to make it my own, but also to carry the same energy and movement because it is the same show, you know, even if I bring my own thing to it. We altered the script a little bit, but it's it's Leila's quest for flight. So I wanted to make sure that I carried that through. Um, so it was a little bit more, I feel like rehearsals were more tailored for me than for Simone. You know, Simone had been doing it for so long, um, but it, was, it wasn't too hard. I feel like we had such a great chemistry, all of us, and, and rehearsals were so playful. I mean, we just got to experiment and I feel like with touring, especially with going to schools, you learn so much as you go. It's so different than performing on one stage. With this being a traveling group of players, it's like, I mean, your skills are challenged for real. <laughs> you, it's you have different spaces, you have different audiences, you have different ages, and kids are a tough crowd. I mean, they are, um, they can be laughing the entire time, which can be great, or they can be laughing the entire time and it can be horrible. So, <laughs> It, you really get to, um, you know, challenge yourself and how focused can you be through this entire thing while playing like 10 plus characters and, and being vocal and moving around. Yeah. In a different spot every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I call it vaudeville boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say some, two things. First of all, I want to emphasize the chemistry and it happened that, uh, Maya and I, we worked together before, and it was reversed. I was playing her grandmother, and, and we were dancing together. So that was yeah, interesting. Yeah, that was great. So we already knew each other. Yeah. That um, was... We were working on my cousin's short film. So it was honestly so great to see Simone. And I had already known that Simone was doing the show. And I remember I was like, oh my gosh, it's Golden Thread Productions. I need to get involved. And I'm like, Simone, like, like a star, hi. <laughs> um, I was like starstruck. <laughs> but then I got involved. It was it was honestly full circle. Definitely. And the other part, I want to emphasize also that it may be a kid's show, but it's for everyone. And I 
as a as a performer and as the player i'm i'm able to look at everybody in the room and i'm telling you everybody is reacting and laughing and sometimes making weird faces the teachers the parents we we played also for all, uh, elderly people everybody is having fun it's really a beautiful show i'm I'm going to say that over and over. It is a beautiful show. I'm glad you brought that up, Simone, because I think that playing in the senior center was one of my favorite shows that we ever did. There was so many technological technic, technical challenges, but that show was really rewarding. That's that's an experiment we did to see. We did an outreach to uh, elderly housing facilities. Um, to see if you know a children's show would be would appeal to them, and I remember watching them. You know, I could see the profiles of rows of audience, and they were awestruck. They were like, <laughs> they were engaged. They loved. They it. were absolutely engaged. It was. I expected some people falling asleep or losing interest, <laughs> or even walking away, but they didn't. It was really great. No, we had to hold the doors so everyone could get in. Yeah, they yeah. Mm -hmm. and one of the things again, just aesthetically, that's um, it's not unique to fairy tale players, but it's it's a choice we make is that we uh, we don't have a fourth wall, right? So we engage with the audience directly, and there's actually audience interaction. Um, and in Layla's quest, Maya, you lead the audience interaction mainly, so you have to recruit. Uh, volunteers to come uh, talk about how that what that is what are what you're doing and how uh, how your experience has been doing it yeah so um, that was I think for me the most stressful part of the show more than anything because I always was taken out you know as soon as you break that fourth wall and I'm still player one but I'm now trying to communicate with children to be like now stand on this x now stand here while running the show at the same time. So that was incredibly stressful every night. I don't think I ever didn't have like a mini panic attack before it happened, but luckily we had a system. Um, me and Sada had a, we all had a system, but Sada would kind of pick them before we do it before. And that way we knew who the volunteers were because it was a lot less stressful than picking them in the middle of the show. And especially since we were on a really tight time frame. I think we only had 30 minutes, right, if I remember. And um, yeah, these kids were, everyone wants to volunteer, obviously. So uh, yeah, but it was, I think that is what made the show is that the kids are involved. The interaction is what gets them so hyped. It's that they know that they actually have a chance to be a part of it. So, so just tell us, what do they get to do? What do the kids do? Yeah, so the kids get to um, well, everyone gets to involve, be involved vocally. So we'll ask them the questions. They get to respond. They get to sing the alphabet with us. So everyone is involved in that way. Um, and then we have volunteers that come up and hold up birds as we go through the alphabet. And then they can fly around with the birds and they actually get to be a character. So they get it every single time it was different. Every kid brought something different. You either flap the birds up in the air or you just run around with it or you become the bird some kids would flap their own wings their own arms um and uh yeah so it was it was very quick enough for them to feel involved um but also not take over the show yeah i have to say that as a viewer one of the most gratifying moments in the play is actually for me is when kids be, repeat the arabic alphabet uh, because I feel that by itself, learning the first seven letters of the Arabic alphabet and feel, feeling comfortable with that, including kh, which is tough in it for English speakers, like that feels like such a triumph to me, you know, and breaking of barriers and stereotypes. Um, one other thing in the performance is that at the end, both of you, actors, Simone and Maya, wear these giant birds, bird wings, right? Costume pieces. And Simone, you have to turn as the kids 
circle around you. Uh, what is that challenge like? Well, <clears throat> it, it reminds me another challenge I had when I was in another uh, theater company, a street com uh, theater company, where I was wearing masks so I could barely see. And my challenge to, was to not hurt the kids. This time I could see. So it was not as challenging, but still, I have to be really careful that I'm not hurting anybody with my big wings. So I bring them towards me and I peek out so I can see that I'm not hurting anybody with uh, either my wings or, or, you know, another part of my body. <laughs> But yeah, of course, I have to be very vigilant and be sure that I'm not hurting anybody <laughs> and um, and then be having fun. And most of the time they do. Maya is the one who's uh, leading the, the circle. So I rely on her as well. <laughs> have there ever been instances where you were a little like you had to pull the kids away or something like that? I don't recall uh, um, something like that. No. I'll speak up on that one. There's only been one instance where there was maybe a kid who didn't know to follow out and I had to pull them over to come sit back uh -huh. over here with me wherever they were holding on on the edge of the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah, you constructed those giant wings. Talk a little bit about, I mean, we have a production designer, Mokhtar Paki, who hand painted did all the, art, yeah. the cover. But then you did the construction and the fixing of the head so mm -hmm. that the actors can see what right. they're doing. So talk a little bit about that process. So uh, Mokhtar is a fine art painter and a caricaturist and um, set designer. And so he made uh, his paintings more in a flat sort of way. So the wings themselves were beautifully painted, uh, but we had to add a hood. So I took um, some similar fabric and constructed a hood for each bird and then made a way for the flat wings to wrap around the body. And then I connected them to some Isis dance wings, which already are very bird-like and Middle Eastern dance um, accessory. So we had some more full circle shapes that we could make. And then it had the little dancing sticks so that we could extend that beautiful painting of a bird beyond um, the palette onto the body and around. So um, it was cool that the wings existed for me to build off of, but then I built him a hood and then he got to paint on something that already existed for a body to finish that before I got before I mounted it. So it was a little back and forth play between um, Mokhtar and I to determine how this art style that he developed for the show could wrap around a body and be used in three dimensions. Yeah, and I should add that, um, so we've been working with Mokhtar for the past two shows, two or three shows where he- uh, um, He definitely did um, uh, 21 days. Tamar. Oh, I see. definitely so did Tamar too. Three shows. So, okay. 21 days, Tamar, and uh, yeah, so far, uh, Golden Thread Fairy Tale players, we have a repertoire of seven original plays for children, so that's great. And, um, Mukhtar, who is a fine artist, um, hand paints our props. So all the birds are hand cut puppets. by hand and hand painted. Mm -hmm. The Palestinian village is hand painted. So each piece is like, you know, a work of art. And <clears throat> one of the early uh, issues that we noticed was the kids would take the birds and keep <laughs> Them on the floor. Right. How you, so how did you manage? All the props had to be reinforced from the beginning because Mokhtar made a beautiful thing and then we had to make it kid proof, which is, you know, <laughs> actor proof minus 10 years. <laughs> yes. yes, that was fun. That was fun. Um, so I, I also want to ask you a little bit about your theater training. Um, so this this kind of theater that we're doing with fairy tale players is very specific. Um, what kind of training did you have before that prepared you for uh, performing um, in fairy tale players? And if not, then um, you know what have you learned? I guess from performing in fairy tale players. And I'll start with Sarah since again, yeah, go ahead. 
Okay. Um, for me, I started performing in high school plays, like Little Shop of Horror, you know, side character, um, and same thing, side character, Christmas Carol. You're always like, you know, that character, because you look like this, you're not the leading person, you're that over there. So that was my experience in theater and performing. Um, so I was like, okay, I would rather participate in something that I can make that is for everyone. So I uh, trained as a costumer. So I have a costume design background, um, fashion show production, um, the theater costumes. Um, and then when I moved to San Francisco, I started a, my uh, cabaret performance group called the New Eccentrics. And we made the world's first pop-up book musical. So it was very interactive, kind of a street show kind of thing. I worked with the new old time Chautauqua, which tours underserved communities that don't get live performance. Um, and we did that, uh, I did that with them for four or five years and they've been doing it for 40 years. Um, and so I took that into my interactive children's performance as a fairy or a unicorn or a mermaid and, or you know, a roller skating lightning bug at some corporate event. So my background is mainly in interactive entertainment so that's why I think that I can really support the actors with the audience participation portion and make sure that I call the right audience volunteers that are going to feed the show instead of, you know, suck from it. Um, so, yeah, that's my background. I mean, we don't get to do that kind of interactive in performance right now unless it's through the screen. So I'm glad that we still get to make this for Layla. Yeah. Uh, Simone? How about you? Oh, well, performing. I started performing when I was a little girl as a ballerina. Then uh, I joined a, a theater group in middle school, and I'm still in contact with the, the student who was leading. And he's a, he's a professional um, actor, musician, director, and a professor in France. Yeah, I forgot to say I grew up in France. It's maybe important to say that. <laughs> and um, and then uh, and then I joined so um, different theater groups, different theater schools, different dance schools. <laughs> yeah, I have a background in dance, which uh, allows me to uh, become a physical theater quite easily also and you also mentioned street theater yes so that's what is that I'm like saying. so what happened is when i came here almost 20 years ago unfortunately i came with an injury so i had to change my plans because i wasn't very uh, uh i couldn't i could barely walk but i could i did manage to perform and to join um a physical theater group called uh, Sun and Moon Ensemble, and I with big puppets and maskies, and I did a lot of street performances. Um, we had a residence for a year in the Yerba Buena's garden, so I really learned, did a lot of parades, a lot of interaction with the kids, but not only the kids, adults as well. I've done things with adults when I. When I was in Avignon in France, you know, you have to kind of, uh, you know, when you do parades to uh, attract the people so they come see your show. So I've, I've learned a lot by doing that because, as I say, I had sometimes masks I could barely see. And I had a little kid coming next to me and I had no idea that he was right underneath me. <laughs> killed anybody so I'm good <laughs> but I had so much fun doing that it's something that I had not done in the past and I realized I love in interaction I also done a lot of um, uh, with another group that uh, doesn't exist in, anymore it's, it's called Blue Heart Planet I did a lot of interactive uh, theater with map and the mission it's a long time ago. It's like 15 years ago, 16 years ago, 17 years ago. To me, it seems like yesterday, but that's okay. <laughs> but I, I learned to, to do things interact, uh, in an in interactive way, which was not my training. I was more, more classic. I mean, always very physical, 
but um, not so much with interaction. So I, I learn. Great. Well. And Maya, you talked about just having a, I don't know, a regular theater training. To, uh, talk a little bit about what that means and then how do you have to, what's challenging about fairy tale players? Um, yeah, so I have, I guess, like the cookie cutter, I guess, uh, theater training. I, I got my BA at San Francisco State University. And then I trained in New York for um, three months at Stella Adler. And I mean, I, I feel like I've always said this school, I feel like art and school, for me personally, they don't mesh. And so everything I learned, it lives inside of me and it aids me. But um, when you're doing a show like Leila's Quest, it's really your imagination and you can't train your imagination in school. You can strengthen it by, you know, being more creative in your days. But I don't think that, I don't think necessarily that my training is the reason for my performance in Leila's Quest um, mm -hmm. in any, whatever that performance is. But I do have to say that at specifically at Stella Adler, I we had clown classes, movement classes, voice classes. So I did have to pinpoint what my weaknesses were. And I saw them when we were rehearsing. I saw my energy and I have to be bigger than life and I have to be, I have to, you know, move in a different way. And and I think that if I hadn't done the training, I wouldn't have been able to notice those yeah. moments where I was like, oh, I have to work on that. But um I didn't like refer to my books or anything to <laughs> fix those issues. I think I, I, I think it's always experience. And so for me, my greatest training, maybe this is just in my head, but I think my greatest training was in high school and just being able to do shows. And I was lucky enough to go to a really diverse high school that allowed me to have the opportunity to play leads and um, strengthen my performance skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to add something that because I, I was talking about diversity. Um, well, I had mentioned I did two tour in North Africa. I learned a lot about a lot of things, but actually that's where I learned the most about interaction <laughs> because we had so many unexpected events happening during the shows. It was quite something because uh, the like what what unexpected events oh were? well one time we had the army coming <laughs> being on stage or people crossing the stage like nothing happened or mm -hmm. one time we had um <laughs> a fight of the technician um how do you call that uh, being recorded i mean not recorded being um heard, heard yeah. while we were playing on stage mm -hmm. so we have each time we were like gathering and saying okay what if this and this happened each time we had a new thing happening that we were not mm -hmm. prepared for and the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I uh, also worked in the Japanese theater in Paris as well as here as theater of Yugen so I have mm -hmm. different different uh, also training mm -hmm. Uh, well, while we're talking about diversity and representation, um, I know that when I came to the U.S. when I was 14 and there really wasn't much uh, children's programming that had any meaningful Middle Eastern content. Um, and in the Bay Area, when, uh, you know, when Golden Thread started as uh, our audience members were having children, they in fact demanded content for their children, right? Uh, they were fed up with uh, all the, you know, kind of Eurocentric material that was being done at schools. Um, Sarah, I know you had said before in, in one of your past interviews that you wish there were programs like fairy tale players when you were growing up talk about that why is why why does that matter for children i mean i think for me it would have mattered to have a program like fairy tale players visible to me as a school age child and that would have helped me determine that i could focus on theater in 
on purpose initially Mm -hmm. um, because it it represented me or it offered something for me or I it was just something that I could identify with basically so just Mm -hmm. I having something that you know our Middle Eastern kids can identify with I think is important I wish we'd had it for that reason Um, and again it's just centering on our story instead of it being subsequent to another story Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you know um or only the magic fairy tale portion without any of the context yeah yeah how about you uh maya i mean you said you went to a diverse high school um was there any middle eastern content that you got to play with um no i never got to experiment experiment with any Middle Eastern content. Even when I was living in Jordan, I did two years of high school in Jordan. We did plays like The Visit. Um, so we didn't, and Alice in Wonderland and, and stuff like that. So we didn't actually, I didn't know that there were Middle Eastern plays. I didn't know that there were Middle Eastern playwrights. I'm sure I, I'm sure they existed. I just didn't, I didn't have that content. Um, What's the difference when you, as a performer, what's the difference when you play the part of a Palestinian girl as opposed to, I don't know, Alice in Wonderland? There is no difference. There's, it's, I think that if you were to do the role of Alice in Wonderland well, you would achieve the same depth that you would as playing a Palestinian or um, any character that is rooted, has the same cultural background as you. I think that the only thing is that you understand that in a certain way, but you understand that culture in a certain way. But the thing is, if I were to pick up a a play right now and play a Palestinian character who's 23 years old, I can't use my own experiences because I was raised in America. I don't have the same experience as someone who was raised in Palestine. Um, Mm -hmm. and everybody is individual. So I actually think that it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't have more of an emotional connection. Um, personal as a person, not, not as an actor. I think there's more pressure and responsibility, Mm -hmm. but I think again, as an actor, it is your responsibility to find that emotional connection regardless, but it Mm -hmm. might be easier if you Mm -hmm. were emotionally connected. Um, I don't know. It, I think it's very specific to a person and how involved they are because someone could pick up a role, someone who was raised in Palestine could pick up that role and do it probably in the moment because their emotional level is way higher than, you know, I'm not, I'm not going through the same thing that someone from Palestine is going through. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. people in Palestine are even not going through the same thing as other people in Palestine. You know, there's right. so many different yeah. experiences. Yeah, I mean, and also there is the whole idea of theater being an opportunity to enter someone else's experience and character, right? right? So that's why we do theater. We don't do theater just to play ourselves, right? right. Because if if that was satisfying, then we didn't do <laughs> we wouldn't do theater. Then we wouldn't need <laughs> it, right? And you find um, yourself in that in the character. So mm-hmm. obviously it's more fun to find yourself in a character that is similar to you. Yeah, yeah, um, I guess I'm, I'm looking at it more in terms of storytelling. Maybe, Sarah, what is your take on this in terms of being able to tell these stories? I think it's good for everyone. Uh, I definitely had my only emotional moment as a stage manager when I was backstage and the whole audience repeated the entire first few letters of the Arabic alphabet. And I saw all the teachers look around at each other and be like, yeah, that was good. And I was like, this is important. And I like Mm -hmm. had a little heart swell and I got all teary and I'm like, just getting ready for the next thing. So uh, um, it's a good teaching moment Mm -hmm. that we get to welcome folks into this culture that otherwise have zero reference point. I mean, we're talking about how we have no content available for us. So that means that nobody else gets anything but what they see on Mm -hmm. the news. Mm -hmm. So it's Mm -hmm. a great teaching tool for everyone. Mm -hmm. Simone, anything you'd like to add? Well, I I have a a strange position because I'm playing this six-year-old 
a Palestinian, Palestinian little girl. I am not Palestinian. I am French. I'm <laughs> playing in English. I do uh, say a couple things in Arabic, and because of my past, I did learn a little bit of Arabic, I mean, dialect in Algeria. So, so I, I did have an entry in the culture that was completely foreign for me, even though there's a lot of North African in, in, uh, in France, there's also this dichotomy, like there's no really, I mean, it's changing a bit now, but um, people had no idea what it is to, to have uh, this, this kind of culture. And there's so many prejudices and so many, um, can I say, like, uh, as you say, a lot of things come from the media. It's 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 very negative in in general, or s extremely simplified, you mm -hmm. know, with 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 Disney and things like that. You know, very mm -hmm. very simplified. Mm -hmm. So it's an honor for me, and at the same time, I I keep saying it. It was a pleasure, mm -hmm. <laughs> a real pleasure, because we. Have... Sorry, go ahead, finish. It's just uh, uh, as I say. I mean playing something else than you are that that's the treat you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have a, an audience question what is an audience interaction that filled you with joy or you could never forget who I already said mine when they when they said when they all said when the they alphabet all, when they sang the alphabet i just had like a sweeping moment way where i was like whoa this is important mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. But uh, there were some, there was some great little kid interaction. I'm going to go back to when I was um, to Princess Tamar and Tamar Rescues Nazar the Brave um, show when we performed at KZV school. So that's an, an Armenian folk, of, folk yeah, play. That. Folk tale. And I'm not Armenian, but I got to play Princess Tamar Rescues Nazar the Brave in front of an audience of Armenian children that know this story like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, that know all the characters in the story, they know all the words that we said, and they were so thrilled that we told their story to them. So that would be my best audience interaction. Yes, and they brought you flowers after the show. They gave me a sweatshirt for the school, they invited <laughs> us back, to, we did it twice there. It yeah. was great. Yeah, how about you guys, Simone? How about uh, it's the hugs afterwards <laughs> when we could hug. Yeah, that's all the little kids go, Can I hug you? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, so this they... is as the class is leaving. After, yes. yeah, we do we our stand there and say goodbye to them. Yeah, I, I, yeah we I... give them a QA after, we give them a QA yeah. right after, and then the, then the QA never ends because they all want to hug. <laughs> <Layla>. <laughs> and yeah, and then some kids wanted to. Uh, to write and draw things. I don't know if it really happened, but they had the desire, but the hug. They do. They Sometimes we receive thank you postcards from classrooms. Yes. They're posted on our website. That's really. Hey. How about yeah, you, hug. Maya? Any unforgettable audience interaction moments? Yes. Um, I think this happened a few times, but whenever there's a Middle Eastern um, child in the audience and it's never more than two or three kids um, you can just see them shocked they're shocked that they've been represented and they don't even look at it as representation it's just like I know I, I know what that word means you know mm -hmm. I know the alphabet I can sing it to you right now yeah. um, feeling like oh I'm accomplished because I understand this kind of like there's there's richness to that and that was that was for me the best. That's for me the best part of the whole show is reaching mm -hmm. out to the Middle Eastern kids, um, and we've had and Palestinian kids were there too. Specifically, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. Um, and and or street cred with their friends when the, when when they can tell what the what the language is and they all know that that kid speaks Arabic, so everybody gets to look at them and be like, yeah, that oh, was, they yeah, knew it's, it's going an interesting, on. It's an interesting reversal because prior to that, you're considered a weirdo. Right. That speaks a foreign language, then, you know, afterwards you're like, oh, you're so special because you speak cool this kid. language mm -hmm. that was performed, you know? So there's, there's a big reversal there. I remember, especially, um, go ahead. sorry, especially when the dance music comes on 
And the folk dance music is so universal across all cultures so that kids that are participating from other cultures, they can acknowledge that this folk dance is legit and the music, they hear the music and they're like, that's cool. So it, the, you know, the coolness factor is amplified for the kids that identify with the show because everybody else who knows anything about their own culture or background can acknowledge that the music and the dancing was, was right on. <laughs> yeah, the, kids, the kids thought we were very cool. <laughs> <laughs> We, were we should cool. <laughs> we should acknowledge our choreographer Lisa Tatiosian, yes. who's been with uh, Fairy Tale Players for a few productions now. Um, I was just going to share that one day I was at my local Trader Joe's on Four Lake Shore back then, um, and th this is when we were doing the girl who lost her smile. Um, and that is about the name of the girl is Jahan. And she has lost her smile and all these performers come to help her find her smile. And Jahan means the world. The world, yeah. Um, and I was, you know, at my local uh, Trader Joe's and then this little girl came to me and <laughs> pulled, pulled my sleeve and showed, showed me to her mom and said, they were at, at our school today. They performed at our school. And she told me all about Jahan and how she, and then she like gave me the best summary of the, of the play <laughs> and, a and a review, you know, <laughs> positive review to her mom. It was like, I was just kind of stunned. And her mom said, she hasn't stopped talking about it since she saw the performance. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That was great. Um, so we should uh, say that Layla's Quest for Flight has now uh, become, or we have produced it as a radio play featuring Maya and Simone and Sarah as our stage manager. So that radio play will be released uh, next week on November 10th, and you'll be able to listen to it uh, for free anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can find a link to it uh, on Golden Thread's website, goldenthread.org, um, or on your podcast services. Um, so I, I'm just curious, after you've, I don't know, performed, what, 40 shows in person in front of an audience, then you had to do a radio play. What was that like? Um, I think for me, I really enjoyed the radio play because I didn't have to worry about moving and I didn't have to worry <laughs> about my physicality. You know, I'm always, that's what's on my mind. I feel like for performers, it's like, you have to make sure you're, everything is on point. But this was just like, you just go. I mean, I don't know. I didn't watch myself. I don't know, Simone, if you watched yourself, but you guys watched us. We probably looked crazy. Like, <laughs> I feel like I was flying around the room and... <laughs> I was like up and down and you're just not really self-conscious when you're doing it, which I really liked. I thought it's funny that you said you didn't have to think about moving because you had to think about not moving <laughs> too much away from your microphone. <laughs> For me, I, I kept saying it was bittersweet. It's like, it was like the grief of, of uh, not tumbling and, and we had to cut some part and at the same time, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed. I I like uh, I like um, uh, how do you say voiceover and things like that. I re I really like to to do this kind of thing and putting all the energy in the voice instead of the movement. <laughs> yeah, we had to rein it in. We had to tell you, don't move your arms so much. <laughs> You're used to tumbling on on the floor. Yeah, well, I used to do all kind of things, mm -hmm. and uh, so. Well, I, I imagine it's tough in terms of timing, isn't it? Well, because when you learn your lines, you usually learn your lines with your action, and you kind of time it, right? So, yeah, absolutely. And she's been doing it for so long in the same yeah. way that she hasn't separated the movement from the action. They're like ingrained in her body, so that's why <laughs> it's such a challenge. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that's why we had a rehearsals because, uh, well, it does require some work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but no, did it, it did fun. it feel less satisfying because you were no. moving? No, it was actually very pleasurable. 
Mm-hmm. I, I liked it a lot, as I say. Mm-hmm. But I really like this show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It yeah. was, I would say we weren't performing for the kids. We didn't have to, yeah. we didn't have to do it. Like when you're performing for kids, you have to keep in mind that you're performing for kids. So you have to do this, this, and this. But I felt like we were performing for ourselves. And that's the, why the performance, I think, was we did a great job was because it was just like me and Simone acting like you know it was just me and Simone being these characters and it was so much fun we didn't have to think about anyone who was watching um but obviously it's always better with an audience because you want to hear the response yeah you didn't get that live response but it was so nice that you guys got to play the show that you already love to each other who you already love and know and that you just got to just bounce it back and forth and we still have our audience participation portion and then we just faked it with us for you for your guys' sake uh i'm excited by the radio play being available worldwide right yeah um and curious, for example, if kids in Palestine will will listen to it, and how you know how will they respond mm-hmm. to to your performance? And you know, uh, as you said, this is a play in English based on Palestinian folk tales, but it's still in English. So you know, what is that like? Uh, so I'm really curious to hear back from folks as more people uh, listen to the radio play. You have a question about that. I know you could said it's going to be in podcast form, but will there eventually be a version on YouTube with our, like maybe our slides of our illustrations? Set that, that's, that's not in the plans. No, okay. because we actually have Fan to, art. we'll have to make it. The release <laughs> is limited. So uh-huh. our union contract re- limits our release okay. time. So mm-hmm. we're just going to focus on the radio play and Cool. Not um, and on YouTube, you know, it becomes like a slideshow and right. audio thing, and it's a little mm-hmm. conf- I don't know. I think distracting it's confusing and distracting. Yeah, yeah, it's distracting if you see pictures that do not exactly match what people are right. saying. Yeah, um, but Laura Espino, our uh, program manager has created an interactive activity guide for to go along with the radio play so it has a lot of interesting stuff where you can build your own wings uh it has audio um cues that you can click on and you can hear the uh, alphabet, alphabet spoken so you can learn the alphabet song you can learn the whole alphabet so it's it's a lot of fun um and so they'll go on our website next week also so you know i think it's a really nice package for kids and families to learn more um uh learn more about uh you know l- learn more about Palestinian folk tales and and also you know little girls. Uh, one of our uh, audience members is asking what theme or themes in Leila's quest do you think resonates the most with children in the audience? Who wants to jump on that? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I think the you know the hard work, do what you dream kind of thing for kids, you know, like don't let people tell you what you can or can't do theme. Um, Yeah. Jump in others, go ahead. I was thinking of the fear in school. Yeah, the first day of school. Uh, I remember myself and I've seen other kids, uh, the anxiety of of going into school and, and, not knowing what's going to happen. I remember that very, very well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Long time ago. Yeah. I think the biggest theme that I think resonates with the kids um, is follow your dreams. What Sada said. Yeah. I think, I think mm-hmm. that was, um, I think that's what they grasp onto the most. But I also think another one is have fun. You know, we're singing and dancing and um, a lot of the volunteers were really shy. Um, even though they volunteered and 
they still like got to loosen up I think that was a huge lesson in that in that show mm -hmm. I think there's another one is the 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 rolling the mischievousness of the rolling pot I think mm -hmm. the fact that it's mischievous is like yay she's doing that naughty pot stuff. <laughs> naughty pot <laughs> everybody yeah everybody liked how she got in trouble <laughs> I, I always thought the play is a girl power play. Is that not a theme that uh, comes through, do you think? Well, we're all girls. I think that, um, <laughs> do that what goes you dream. without saying. I'm like, well, the do what you dream, yes, it's also very specific to females because she gets to have the story about her. Yeah. I mean, I that think... it has a female name in the title is, is yeah. good. I think it's indirectly a theme. I don't think, I mean, we do kind of touch on it with the, uh, you know, I'm the only girl at school, mm -hmm. that whole, there's a whole portion about that. Um, but I think just the fact that it is a girl, she's a girl, Leila in the title, um, that alone is girl power without right. having to like, touch on it in the actual show. Yeah, and also showing up all female show, all female production. Exactly. They see it, they can see yeah, it. Like what you said, yeah. Has anyone ever commented on that? in your experience? Any audience members commented no. on it? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. No, but I, I think that we had we more one... participation from girls because of it. Yeah, we uh -huh. did have one girl who wanted to be a pilot. Uh -huh. And she did say that at the end during the, the, during the that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. That's always fun when you ask the kids what they want to become when they grow up. Yeah, yeah. that's a... Um, Fun question. Any final comments or uh, reflections before we wrap up? Speaking of our our questions that we ask the kids at the end, I mean, we open it for them to ask us questions, but we also ask them things like, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" and "What are what are your back What other languages can you speak besides English?" And it's really wonderful to see all the kids want to participate in that because they're not always going to speak up in a school where they speak in English or they only speak in Mandarin or whatever, wherever we are. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it seems to kind of open the rest of the kids' eyes to each other and look around and be like, wow, I didn't know they could speak French and Chinese. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I want to thank all of you for <clears throat> participating in today's episode of No Summary conversations with artists who don't fit in a box, which I think we demonstrated, even this, this though kind of on video we fit in a box that, but in life <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> we don't fit in a box. Um, this has been brought to you by Golden Thread Productions. I want to thank our partners at HowlRound for live streaming. Uh, there will be an archive of this conversation on Golden Thread's website and on Golden Thread's Facebook page. This is the last no summary of this year, but we are planning to continue the series next year. And this will be part of our uh, efforts to provide digital content uh, at no cost to our audience worldwide. <clears throat> so if you are able to please make a donation to Golden Thread Productions, I wouldn't be doing my job right if I didn't ask for a donation. Um, and spread the word, Layla's Quest for Flight, the radio play will be released next week, November 10th, when um, we will know who our next president is. And she right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>